Hola, bienvenidos al séptimo Serializados Fest, eh, Festival Internacional de Series. Eh, este año tan raro, 2020, pues estamos vía internet, como está todo el mundo, pero eso no nos quita la, la ilusión que nos hace recibir a, a gente como Sally Wainwright. Eh, quien dice ilusión, dice en mi caso euforia desmedida. Voy a intentar que no se me note mucho la ilusión que me hace el hablar con ella esta tarde, eh, para mí es, eh, no sé, tocar la sábana santa prácticamente, <risa> tener la oportunidad de compartir un rato hablando sobre su trabajo y comentando cómo hace ella las cosas y, y, y cuál, es, cuál ha sido su trayectoria en lo que nos, nos dé tiempo eh, durante los últimos años hasta llegar a este punto, en el que tiene entre manos una serie, Gentleman Jack, que eh, ha logrado hacer después de 20 años de intentar sacar adelante la... Historia de su, de su paisana, Anne Lister, esta terrateniente que vivía en todos los sentidos como un hombre a principios del siglo XIX. Y eh, pues esto lo, tuvo ocasión de hacerlo Sally Wainwright cuando, eh, después del exitazo internacional de, de Happy Valley, a pesar de que ella ya era un tótem en Inglaterra con un montón de series, ella lleva trabajando desde los 90, eh, como showrunner desde el 2002, y ha tenido, pues entre exitazos, fracasos, trabajar para eh, ajenas y sus series propias, pues un montón de títulos que incluyen Last Time in Halifax, Scott, Scott and Bailey, Jane Hall, Unforgiven, eh, un montón, un montón de, de títulos que intentaremos eh, cubrir en la medida de lo posible. Sally Wainwright eh, tiene una capacidad asombrosa para crear drama y comedia sofisticados a partir de personajes y situaciones cotidianas, tiene un oído portentoso para el diálogo y, como os decía, de todo esto pues intentaremos eh, cubrir un ratito. Eh, Sally Wainwright, hello, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> how are you holding up with these weird times that we're living? Um, not, not too bad. It's, it's kind of affected my concentration. That's the one. Yeah. Not really, as a writer. I, felt, yeah. um, uh, I don't usually have a problem concentrating, <laughs> but it's, it's, I think that's the big thing for me. Yeah, it's it's hard. Um, I wanted to start by uh, remembering that uh, you started out as a writer for um, radio, actually in a mythical uh, series, radio series called The Archer, that if I'm not mistaken, you used to hear in your house when you were a kid, although you were not paying much attention to that. <laughs> yeah, um, my mom used to listen to it. Mm -hmm. It was always on, but I never actually concentrated on what was going on. Yeah. And then when I was, I think I was 24 or 25, I got the chance to write it. Mm -hmm. So my mum gave me a crash course on all the things I hadn't been listening to. <laughs> and um, I, did, I wrote a trial script and they took me on to um, be a staff writer on, on The Archers. The and Archers. It was, it was a really good experience. Um, just lear learning a lot about... Um, telling continuous stories and and the discipline of um you know turning in five 50 minute scripts uh with a, a um a limited number of characters and very specific numbers of scenes it was a real discipline and it was it was great fun and it was agricultural uh, which i loved i loved anything to do with agriculture so. <laughs> i know that uh so um in your film uh to walk invisible which is about the bronte sisters you talk about the hesitation to write, the uh, fear to be laughed at, the um, joy of being recognized as an author, not to compare your experience with, you know, with theirs and what happened uh, 200 years ago, but still it has some echo in what, you know, what happened to a writer anytime. So when, 
my question would be, when, you, when it was, a con was it a conscious decision for you to become a writer? Um, I don't think it was a conscious decision exactly, <laughs> but I think, um, I, th I think, um, I, I, always, I always wrote, I've always written ever since I was tiny, you know, from being little, me and, as you do, as children, you do write stories, you know, we all write stories, <laughs> yeah. children. and I think I just never grew out of it. And then when I was about 12 or 13, I, um, I, I, de I decided very, de de there was a very clear moment when I knew I wanted to write television. Yeah. And um, uh, it, 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 it wasn't a decision exactly, it was just um, a, a passion really. So it wasn't a decision as such. Um, it gets, I, you know, I do think you, you, you are born wanting, you, I think you're born with a compulsion to write. Um, but we know whether you actually make a living out of it or not. I think the, the, the compulsion to write is kind of, it kind of dictates itself to you. So I don't, uh, you know, for me, there was never a decision that I was going to be a writer. It was, it was just always there. So that's another similarity with Brontes too, that compulsion, I mean. <laughs> so, um, that young Sally Wainwright at home with the, the parents, I was not going to, to make a... <laughs> so um, what, did, what did she watch on TV? Because we know we, she heard oh, the arches. As a child, I watched yes. everything. <laughs> <laughs> not, yeah, not the arches. But do you have favourites? Um, I had a lot of favourites. Um, yeah. But I was, I was very indiscriminate. As a child, I would literally watch anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Another compulsion. compulsion. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I didn't read. I didn't read very much. And I think I was dyslexic. So I, I, I really struggled to get any pleasure from books. Mm -hmm. Unlike the rest of my family read a lot. Um, and I just, I just felt, found TV very compulsive. Um, and I think as a kid, I, I, the, there were definite shows that really struck me more than others. But, but when I was 12, I saw Rock Follies. It was actually Rock Follies of 77. It was the second series. I never saw the first series. And that really spoke to me. It really um, affected me. It was very exciting. It was very, it was very cool. It was very funky. It was, um, it was very unusual, actually. It had three female leads in it. Yeah. Um, and I think I did, right looking back, right from then, I did always find shows that were about women much more compelling than shows... It was so, I mean, most shows were about men, so it was quite yeah. unusual to have shows about women, about female experience, and even then they were often written by men. Yeah, trying to reach some visibility, some, you yeah. know, portrayal or someone that looked, you know, feels and looks like oneself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, the uh, first show that I really liked when about that age was um, The Duchess of Duke Street, which again was a, about an interesting woman. Mm -hmm. So, I a man, I think it was written by Johnny Hawksworth. Um, but um, yeah, so I was, I, 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 looking back at the shows that really interested me even then as a 12, 13 year old, tended to be ones that, Ju uh, Juliet Bravo, I don't know if that's a show you've ever heard of, that was amazing. Yeah, I've heard, of, it's not uh, known in, probably in Spain, but yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I was thinking about, um, let's go to what is probably the uh, most well known of your works uh, to, the, to the date, which is Happy Valley, who, which uh, first five minutes is probably, um, an intensive course of how to introduce a character um, and do it perfectly. Uh, so if you watch it and you read it on script, uh, it's worth like hours of script writing class. <laughs> That's, uh, I can tell. So um, you write not only good dialogue, we will go to that, uh, extremely good dialogue, uh, fantastic, uh, but also you create very, very believable situations in which a character gives a lot of information without being artificial, which is something that you need good craft for that for that so i remember i was remembering a bit in unforgiven in which she that this the main character goes out of prison and she's meeting the new parole officer and they're talking about the former parole officer and they say she's dead and she said yeah she was too fat i was always telling her that she had to cut it down so now you know that she's blunt and she's uh, clumsy in her social abilities but she's also a good person because she cares you know it is like it's a detail, just like that. This is something that you do out of style, which I, I'm sure you do, but, um, uh, but also because it is saving time. Actually, you write in TV and you need to make things concise and precise. Mm -hmm. 
yeah um yeah i mean it's a uh, you know you for me it's always important to keep the audience engaged moment by moment by moment because i think we you know we're writing a medium that is very switch offable yeah and um uh you know when i write any scene it's 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 almost like thinking about gags except for me it's <laughs> about keeping people just there watching you know with information 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 mm -hmm. and you know ideally you you know any one scene is is working on a few levels so there's different layers of information being put across at any one time um i'm just writing a scene at the moment in gentleman jack where it gets more and more intense but i have to put across more and more information as it gets more and more intense it's quite a convoluted um plot yeah the finale of the episode and um it's it, i i at the moment i'm just in a bit of a fog because i've got confused <laughs> with my own information that i'm trying yeah. to seamlessly convey <laughs> <laughs> So of all the uh, works that a writer has to have to, to support themselves whenever they don't make a living as a, as a writer, probably driving a bus in London is one of the <laughs> weirdest that I've ever heard of regarding a, actually a, a woman. Uh, it stands out, actually. <laughs> and you use that to create a, a series, a show called Jane Hall, mm -hmm. based on your own experience as a young college, well, or after college girl that goes to London and tries to make a, a live. And how was that? Because you did that years after, of course, that you came up with, uh, you know, you know, pitching them that or throwing that onto the table. It, w it was one of my less uh, successful efforts. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, I, I, I felt a bit kind of messed around by the channel. It was for ICV and it was originally called Jane Hall's Big Bad Bus Ride. Yeah. And it was meant to be about her wanting to go up to London and be a stand-up comedian. Mm -hmm. And that side of the story just got completely ditched because ITV gave us this big note that they didn't think that worked. So it just, <laughs> that premium is Maisel. <laughs> There's a show nowadays about that one. <laughs> it ended up being a story about this woman who was just a, gone up, you know, a graduate who was a bus driver. So they they kind of they kind of. Um, you know, gave this very big note that at the time I didn't fight against. Um, I kind of just went with, the, assumed, well, assumed that they knew more than I did. And uh, it ended up being a, just a bit of a romantic comedy rather than yeah. a, other, this whole other aspect to it that was intended. And, and you know, look, I was thinking about this the other day, um, you know, just calling it Jane Hall. It just meant nothing. It was just an, a rather boring name. Yeah, it could be anything. And the idea was she was meant to be a bit boring. It was meant to be a name that sounded a bit empty. Mm. But when it was called Jane Hall's Big Bad Bus Ride, it added certain something. But when you just call it Jane Hall, it just... And, um, you know, I was proud of it at the time. But uh, looking back, it, it was... It, the, the concept behind the show, was, by the time it actually got to be filmed, it was pretty lost. Okay, it was... Uh, maybe it was weaker than things that you you know uh, grown to 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 deal with uh, it was a, it was a, a comedy um, or at least it was a hybrid which is what we are in the middle of because there are no you know right genres like per se nowadays everything is very mixed up there is a lot of humor in your work uh, all around but this is a comedy at the home of the wait waits I, i've heard that it is a drama, but I consider it half and half. Uh, I would say it actually starts as a comedy and it has a lot of comedic, comedic uh, uh, beats and very uh, screwball and very vaudeville and very, you know, doors opening and, and people <laughs> jumping out of and, you know, and hiding and I don't want to be discovered and secrets concealed and things like that. So it's a very physical one. Did you have, uh, with that, that was your first show, any kind of... Um, also directions from the channel or the production company regarding the tone like you know more comedy more drama go here or there I don't remember <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that there was I think I think we, we were given a kind of pretty free reign to do what we mm -hmm. want and then the first series was so successful that we just got to make more of it and I think people like that tone it was quite fresh then I think at that it time, was in England, there weren't many shows that, you know, the, the comedy drama uh, genre was kind of just 
coming into existence. And I think the only other drama that was similar at the time was Cold Feet that had a similar kind of, uh, you know, it played around with fantasy. Yeah. That kind of thing. Um, so it, 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 I think it felt really fresh. And so I think, um, again, again, because the first series was so successful, they kind of just let us get on with it for the second and third series. And um, I, I wasn't involved in the third series, but uh, yeah, it was it was good fun. It was a good fun show. And I think um, the the music really helped on that show. I think the music was fantastic. It was by Greg. Uh, yeah, Greg. Uh, I can't forget. I forgot. I interviewed him once. Yeah. Ah, Greg. Greg. Greg uh, he has a brother. He's a composer Harry. too. Yeah. yeah, that's it. <laughs> Williams. Yeah. Williams, is it? Sorry. Anyway, I will. I, I know exactly. I'm. I'm going to. Well, this is a disaster. I know. But he really is. captured the essence of the show in that music, and then took it onto another level. And I think, you know, when you've got a theme tune like that on a show, it's gonna. It's gonna be good. <laughs> yeah. So um, you said you stated several times that your that the characters come to you in full form, okay, that, you know, that when, at least the main characters, that uh, whenever you hear them, you know that, that, that they are there. But then you need to explain that to the people that are going to put the money for the thing to be done. And uh, um, uh, for, for a TV series or a TV movie or whatever. So how do you convince them that they sound great in your head, but uh, you know, without having the most powerful tool in your own words that you have, which is a dialogue. It is like if you could hear them as I hear them, it would, you know, you would understand that it is uh, that they are fantastic. So, how do you deal with the pitching thing, you know, for with the convincing other people that these characters are, are meant to be? I think often for broadcasters, what is important is stars getting stars on board uh-huh that matters to them probably more than yeah anything i could persuade them of because they know you know we all know that's what gets people watching tv so um i the last the good a lot of the shows i have done over the last 10 years we'd already have a star attached before we pitched it so that kind of bypasses that arg that <laughs> I know, my friend. Well, that doesn't exactly answer your question. We have to, we have something to tell you <laughs> of it, you know. Um, and and then I guess by now I've got a track record, so they know that I do that, and they know I deliver. So, um, uh, you know, it's other than that, it. Um, I can't remember. It's so long ago since I had to pitch a character in that way. Yeah, I, I, you, yeah, I'm going back to things that happened many years ago and I'm sure now you can, you know, you go into, I know for a fact that you go into the room and they're, they're bowing, you know, all the time as they should. But um, uh, yeah, I, I, you've come a long way, you know, to yeah. and you earn your status by, by having to deal with that situation, I guess, many, many, many times. So going to that is, for instance, I was thinking about a show that you had that's called Amazing Mrs. Preacher. That is about a manager of a supermarket that co that goes and get elected for MP. Mm -hmm. uh, also at home with the Braithwaite, we has a the main character is a housewife that wins the lottery and conceals that from their family, uh, her family, and creates a company uh, to do good things. In a nutshell, uh, so I was I was thinking, did you in those days in which they didn't say yes to everything? Uh, did you have to use like over the top subterfuges uh, to write to the point? Sometimes like comedy uh, to put women in situation of power. Like I need to sell them <laughs> this to them, <laughs> so it needs to be not an MP but a supermarket director that could be coming an MP and things like that. You know, to portray this kind of uh, characters was it. My question would be, was it um, more difficult to do it then, I guess, you know, to, to, to try and deal with this kind of main characters? Yeah, I don't remember it being a difficulty, though, because of the main characters being women. It was more just a difficulty of persuading anyone of anything, <laughs> um, you know, in those days. Um, yeah. You know, it was, it's, uh, it's just incredibly hard to get first commissions and early commissions. Yeah. And to persuade anyone that you actually know what you're talking about. Mm. Uh, I, I don't remember 
it being particular. The, the, the biggest problem with Mrs. Pritchard was that it was about politics. Yeah. And it was one of those subjects that a lot of broad have a, the broadcasters used to have, whether it's still true or not, I don't know, but they used to have a list of things that you'd never make a TV show about. And one of them was politics. Yeah. Uh, another one was newspapers. And another one was actors. And <laughs> That just doesn't, isn't true anymore, you know. There's, we have TV shows about all those things there. Um, so I, I think they were taking a risk because of that, rather than because it was about a woman. Um, but that's that's funny. We have that that with. Uh, I'm going to. I need to take the. It is going out of battery. I think so. Um, I think we have that with politics as well here in Spain. We I think, I think broadcasters see. worry that. Politics is boring, and it's, it's yeah. And I think there are clearly exceptions to that. There's the thick of it, and there was, and there's the, um, you know, the uh, yeah, but the satire, and they look at it in a different light, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But um, and and you know, and it didn't get a great audience, which I was very sad about because it was, um, you know, there was a lot. It was it, it was a good show. It, it was, like, yeah. I only had the opportunity to see a couple of episodes of that one because it's not proper edited in DVD, which is something that needs to be dealt with, at least to, to, to be delivered in Spain, which is another story. Um, I want to go back to another show that was not um, an idea of yours. Uh, it was, uh, I think, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mistaken, uh, I'm talking about Scott and Bailey, an initiative of Serene, Serene Jones and Sally Lindsay, and then your former co-producer, Nicholas Schindler. And, um, but it, it, it is a fantastic show. I love that one. Um, but I wanted to address that as a procedural, like it is a classic genre in, in, in television. And it has a lot of effort in that, you know, to, to work in a plot every week, you know, that gets concluded. And then an arc that goes for the six uh, episode season and all that. And um, uh, it has a two part, this question. One would be about the darkness of the uh, product that in your own words, uh, it got you to a very, very depressing place, mm -hmm. uh, personally, as, and as a writer, of course, but uh, you know, like uh, emotionally. And then the thing about the teamwork, for someone like you that had been working for so many years, it comes a time in which it says, they say, enough with the writer's room i want to write on my own on my own terms on my own time and not being you know submitted to that uh week to week you know like meetings and agreeing and all that i'm gonna use now my freedom to you know to have more space um go if you want to for the first one then uh, the uh, one of other darkness yeah space. well when i started writing scott and bailey um it, I, I well no actually when I started writing Scott and Bailey I, I was just kind of making stuff up and um, I met a detective sergeant uh, in a police station in Manchester and I was told I could have an hour with him and it was a bit you and, and the show got rejected it got rejected by both our big broadcasters in England uh -huh. um, and then I met um, a detective inspector called Diane Taylor who retired and um, I met her socially. I, I've kind of forgotten about Scott and Bailey. Uh, yeah, I, you know, it kind of felt like it had gone and it had been rejected. And um, she she talked to me about her job and her work and it just sounded so fresh and it sounded like something I'd never seen on television. Um, I'd never, you know, we, we have a lot of tech, cop shows. I, I, everybody produces a lot of cop shows. It's such staple uh, fare, you know. But um the way she was talking about her job, it just sounded like I'd never seen that on television. I'd never seen what she was describing about um, how she did her job. Um, so a murder squad is made up of about 30 detectives. And, you know, in our country, often it's just two people. It's a, an inspector and a sergeant. And um, I realised that so much of our TV is derivative of, of itself, derivative of other TV shows. And it felt like if I could write a TV show that was what, how Diane described it, it would be new. It would be a, it would be a very new, um, it would have a very new feel to it. Um, so Diane came on board and we revamped the show and it got greenlit. Um, but the, the, the downside of that was that she was often, it wasn't the downside. It was the downside for me psychologically was that 
she had a she had a vast wealth of stories about murders that she'd worked on. Very gruesome. It's, an, and, it's a very and it, yeah, and it it um it was absolutely fascinating. And she was mm. a fascinating woman. She was very she was she was as talented a uh, raconteur as she was a detective. So she was a really good um, person to have on board for a show like that. Um, but the, but 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 the reality of her job, I found, I, I couldn't I couldn't imagine how you could do it and stay um, happy or yeah. thin, you know. And um, it also started. I, st- I also started to find it difficult that we were making entertainment out of it. That you know the reality of um, her world was um, fascinating, and why shouldn't we? you know, make and um, drama out of it and, you know, show it to people. But uh, it, 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 yeah, I really, it, it, it was a very grim world to become part of. Um, uh, and, it, and it did start to have an effect on me psychologically. I think it, t- it took me into quite dark. I, it's just, no, it's just a kind of, I think I had this kind of uh, quite naive innocence before that I lost. Well, you, you you have a tendency to good people, I have to say. Your characters, even your criminals, normally, besides Scott and Bailey, they're basically good people. Sometimes they make mistakes. Uh, but uh, I, think, it's some... I think that's more true in Happy Valley, actually, than I think Scott and Bailey, we did... Um, the other thing we did in Scott and Bailey, which people didn't notice, was that all the criminals in the first series and season were women. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's absolutely right, yeah. <laughs> And we didn't make a big fuss of it. And what women do were by that way, because they were like, these kind of cases, it was like, whoa. Yeah. Until I met Diane, I think, I think I had quite a naive view of the world that most people are basically decent. Yeah. She seemed to have this view of the world that most people are basically twisted. But it's very difficult, I have to say, what you do, which is to go from that point, which is everyone is good, and then go and write things like, I don't know, Last Time in Halifax, which is about good people in their average lives, and making that so compelling in a world uh, that it's at the time that you're writing those shows obsessed with mean guys and, you know, <laughs> and criminals and selling prostitutes. And, and, and it's like all that, in that environment and, the, you know, the... Um, uh, your shows are so uh, fine and so evolved and so so refined uh, and so compelling and so exciting uh, that it it goes it throws every you know thing that you think uh, previously about what these kind of stories are going to offer. I don't know if I explain myself. I'm saying too much words and saying nothing probably. But it is like <laughs> I'm trying to say that are so um, sophisticated, you know, and um, um, I was not trying to to just say uh, probably it would be a it should be a question by the end of that sentence <laughs> but still uh, the thing is uh, you were aware that you were going against the flow like against what you was done at the time that you were doing those shows like yeah, but, you know, I mean, and which is 2012 mm, but I, I it's for me it's always important to be trying to do something new you know I don't mm. I don't want to turn out just another cop show um, or just another period drama, you know. I, I want to. Um, I also want to be trying doing something new. That's something that. I mean, I think that's what's really exciting about telly at the moment. You know, some of the best stuff on Netflix. It it just re- it feels like the the bar has gone up and up and up. Mm. And I want to be part of that. I want to be one of the people pushing the bar up. I don't want to be one of the people uh, just copying what everybody else is doing. Um, and I, I, so I just think we're working in a really exciting world at the moment. And. Um, so, so, you know, again, when I had Scott and Bailey or, or something like Gentleman Jack, it's it's taking a genre but trying to find, you know, n- not necessarily a fireworks display of newness, but subtle ways of why something is new or different or fresh. Yeah. Yeah. About breaking the rules and doing things new. Let's talk about love stories, which uh, you have uh, many all spread all around, like humor in your work. Gentleman Jack has a love story in it, although it's much more. Um, last time in Halifax, uh, the, um, you know, the trigger of the story is this love story uh, between these two elderly that uh, get, a, you know, get reunited after 50 years that being apart and 
decide to get married because it about, it's about time. And uh, but uh, I don't know a bit, but is and, and it has many love stories in it because it is not only the love story of these two characters. Mm. The, 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 there are many people that fall in love in that show and out of love. Um, but I, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm mistaken, but I, in, your, in your work, I see a very clear love story in To Walk Invisible, the, 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 the film, the TV movie that you, you did about the Bronte sisters, like in, in a very atypical way that three sisters has this tragic love story with the brother that inevitably is going to end so badly. Uh, but uh, still, their efforts are just out of love. It is like a, actually, it is a tale of people trying to make a living and to find a place in the world. But also, it is a, the main theme of that film is, is love, is, is a love story and is a sacrifice that, uh, also, isn't it? I don't know if, I'm, if it is um, not the main core. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the four siblings were very close to one another as children and, um, you know, they were very clever children and they probably struggled to find contemporaries in and around Haworth who had their sort of intensity and um, that their creative urges. So they tended to kind of stick together and be regarded as oddities in the village, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the, the three sisters are now known to us as these fantastic writers. And um, uh, what people forget is that Branwell was, was part of the gang. He wasn't, yeah. just, you know, this famous drunk it was, it was it, you know when, as, when they were developing as children he was very central to what they were doing and very ce central to their development he was kind of the leader of their gang um and then he you know went off on this tangent for whatever reasons you know that he wasn't probably as talented as they were well eventually he worked invisible for, for posterity actually and they had the opposite um, uh, situation. They, so, um, sisterhood. I was trying to dramatize a family rather than a, a three famous women. You know, it was, it was about, their, it was very much about their relationship with him, how he influenced them positively when they, they were younger, create, developing their creativity and how he affected their lives negatively when um, things started to go wrong for him. Yeah, it is very interesting. The Trump, you know, the uh, kind of um, interchange in that uh, story with Char Charlotte and 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 him and the pressure that puts in him um, for being, you know, the man of the house and and the one that should be um, well writing and making a living and you know do, you know behaving properly and everything, but still he cannot get get that out of him. Uh, because of the, all of that uh, situation, which is something that it, that it sounds like something that would happen today, you know, with the witnesses that we uh, see as, as, as a reflection of uh, manhood today, okay? It is like that kind of pressure that we're not, uh, you know, they couldn't afford during those days, which is, it makes the story very I, modern. I, 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 I came away from that feeling, sorry, really for Charlotte, because I think yeah. as children... Um, I think he let her down really badly, you know, creatively, I think he let her down. I think as, as um, young adults uh, or teenagers, um, you know, they were, they, they were kind of write, writing partners and he, um, d you know, early on demonstrated quite a lot of potential, nowhere near as much as her, of course, but um, I, th I think she felt really badly let down by him. So her, mm. you know, the, the love that turns to real anger on her part. Um, yeah, that that unsatisfaction and yeah, force for her. Yeah, so I was talking about sisterhood, which is a strong subject in in your work. Yeah. Not in that symbolic idea that we have of sorority and whatever nowadays, but actual sisters. Like in Unforgiven is the main theme. Uh, Brave Waits has sisters all around. Gentleman Jack, Happy Valley is the Brontes. Even non-blood sisters like Last Tango in Halifax has these two characters that, and I'm very um, focused on that idea. You know, in contrast to that sorority idea of fraternity that we have in our minds of a bond that you that you cannot. Uh, help so like an imposed bond that kind of uh, characters that you write that is like 
it is not that we are uh, we love above anything, but we also are condemned with to be one another, you know, beyond anything, which is something that it is not you the thing that you want to talk about whenever you're talking about sisters or fraternity or sisterhood or whatever. And you do it so well, and it is a theme in your work. So do you that, do you find that you know go for it? And it is like I need a sister here for that character to you know to be saying. Well, what she they're rich relationships, sibling relationships, aren't they? In the way that you just outlined, really, in that you you know you um you bound you bound up with them, and yeah. they and they know so much about you, siblings. And that is a risk sometimes. <laughs> but it's and and you're very fond of them, and you hate them. Mm. All the time. So it's 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 very rich stuff. But also as a dramatist, sometimes it's kind of fantasy. You know, it's um. I, I sometimes think I'm writing about fantasy sisters that I would like to have had, or fantasy. I mean, I have got a sister. I have got an old sister, um, and we we were very. Do you, does she know about this? That you fantasize about other sisters? When I was little, she's Dan's older than me, but I always wished we'd had a bigger sister again. Okay, It'd be really cool, and you know, drive us around and do stuff for us. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like we show off about. Um, uh, but I've realised that that is part of. I think why I, I write about sisters a lot is. Um, well, yeah, sorry. When I was little, me and Diane, my sister Diane were very close, and then when she was seventeen, she um, left. She went and married this guy that my parents disapproved of, and she just disappeared out of my life. Um, and I felt quite. It, it really affected me. Um, I felt quite let down. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, she was just getting on with her life and she didn't care about me. Obviously, I was just the irritating little sister. So I think ever since then, I've been trying to... Um, like a longing for the lost sister I'm or something. Trying okay. out. <laughs> yeah. Perfect yet flawed sisterly relationships in, you know, my cloud cuckoo fantasy land. That I <laughs> Another concert is, uh, I was referring to that before, which is the criminals, but specifically the sloppy criminals, which is also, <laughs> you know, sometimes crying in your shows and your stories come out of mediocrity or, you know, puree, you know, uh, sloppiness. They're clumsy. They're people that doesn't know how to do things or they don't care enough and they don't do a good job. So people either get hurt or they trying to get their hurt, you know, other people's hurt, they hurt them more or they get caught. Um, or oh, both. So ironic as it seems to be talking to you about mediocrity, is that something <laughs> that interests you? <laughs> Again, when I worked with Diane Taylor on mm -hmm. Scott Bailey, one of the things I learned that she talked about a lot was that most murders aren't committed by criminal masterminds. They're usually committed by people who are drunk. Mm -hmm. and people who haven't really thought things through um, or people who have got problems mm -hmm. and are suffering in some way and um, aren't responsible for their actions. But that was the big kind of surprise for me, really, that, that the reality of murder is um, really, as, as, as is kind of fairly obvious when you think about it, pretty sordid. Yeah. And I remember having a conversation with Diane about... Um, we were talking about the, the Moors murders, about Myra Hindley. Because I was at, at one stage, I was quite interested in trying to write something about Myra Hindley, which I, I really wouldn't do now. Um, and I asked Diane what she thought it was that someone like Myra Hindley has that um, made her capable of doing what she did, mm -hmm. including with um, Ian Brady. And Diane made the point that it isn't what she's got, it's what she hasn't got, it's what's missing. that. Uh, make someone behave like that. So it really is about people who have got something missing. Um, you know, people who are inadequate in some way. Um, and and um, so that and and of course that's much more interesting than yeah. idiotic criminal masterminds. Um, uh, you know, that's a kind. Of, you know, I know it's a genre that people like, but um, I don't. It doesn't. It doesn't interest me at all. Um, and again, and I also think that you know reality is much more interesting than anything i could make up
And it makes best, better drama, you know, it is yeah. more complex. So you have more layers, you have more, you know, sort of stories and all that. Um, regarding uh, dialogue, which is um, your, your, like, trade mark and uh, your shows are much more but still you 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 always uh, and you rightly so are proud of uh, your skill as a dialogist and uh, it is amazing um, um the thing is you started in the 90s which was a, a time in which there were some creators of course in, in audiovisual that were very keen of uh, you know this kind of natural uh, way of doing things like letting actors improvise, they gave them directions and still you do absolutely the opposite which is to give them uh, good words written and then they apported it as ordinary people. So were you ever tempted to do the opposite thing because I, I've never understand and I've seen many many things done in you know with that intention of improvisation and all that some of them are good but most of them are rubbish and uh and uh, i don't know if you've ever been tempted to work like that because you have uh very you know strict very well written uh parts and still they're so natural and so down to earth which is something that people don't understand that is what you get when things are well written so I guess as a director, I might be tempted to try and work like that, but mm. I don't think I would do it on telly. I think that would yeah. be a thing. I think with telly, it's too there's too much money involved and too little time. That's it. You kind of got to get it right. And a, and a script is a blueprint. A script, is, but it's more than a blueprint. It's it's a map of every, you know everything's based on the script. The shooting schedule is based on the script. Yeah. You know, kind of, there isn't time to improvise. There isn't time to improvise and worry about how wrong it's going to be before it gets right yeah <laughs> now that you can do whatever you want maybe you can try to do a feature film and say okay you go and improvise if not i'm feeding you the lines don't worry i'm here everything's covered um, to be honest all the the, the actors the sense work with wouldn't work like that um yeah. I, I work probably not <laughs> i had an actress on the first series of happy valley who um sorry it was the second series yeah. And she was a bit like that. And she came into audition and it was actually quite exciting. It was interesting. But mm -hmm. um, then the worry is, though, if you've got someone like that, it throws the other actors. If, if, they're, if they're sort yeah, of... Yeah, it breaks their dynamic, yeah. Other well, people don't know what their cues are necessarily. Mm. It's, it's, it's a discipline. <laughs> it's, you know, television is very disciplined when it comes to actually shooting it. And I'm not sure that would work. The other thing as well is I feel like I'm a wordsmith. I love words. I write, I write very precisely. And I, you are. <laughs> a I, wordsmith. I love that word. <laughs> I, I spend a long time getting things exactly right. Yeah. I, I spend a long time getting things so they're very succinct as well. So yeah. I'm saying a lot in the smallest space as I can. So and we thank you for that. <laughs> so improvising is it just expands that so that it would become... A, so much less precise but it's an interesting idea and it's certainly something as a director I'd, I'd explore but not but in probably in a different medium okay uh so um talking about directing you came to direct talking average late in your you know yeah. career uh in your own words because you were not feeling secure enough to approach that you were not secure that you were going to do it right or you were not secure that you were going to be over criticized which is not the same thing um probably the latter mm -hmm. um so i, I you know it's I, I was quite scared about working with actors i, mm -hmm. I was um I'm, I'm in awe of actors so i was i was worried that they, that, that they would I would feel that they were very professional and I was a complete amateur. Um, but um, I think once I've got over that little hurdle, it felt it's, it, I mean, it's, it feels very right to me directing. It feels like this is what I was meant to be doing. Um, and I have always actually done it since, since I was, I, I started directing when I was at university mm -hmm. and I've never really stopped. Um, I, I direct plays in our village with the amateur drama group. Um, which is very good, and um, uh, so I've, it, you know it's a compul. It's like writing; it's always a compulsion. You know, yeah. if I had no one to direct, I'd find some cats and direct them. You know, um, it's a compulsion to do it, whatever you know, with wh whoever is available. Oh yeah. But, um, 
I also thought you had to be trained for long enough. I, I also thought as a director you had to have had some official training, which of course some do and some don't. Um, and um, when I started directing on the, the first proper episode of yeah. Happy Valley, and um, so many people said to me, the first three days will be really difficult. And then after that, it'll just click and you'll feel like this is it. And that was so true. You know, the first three days were really tricky. I felt out of my depth. I thought everybody thought I was stupid. Mm. Um, I thought everybody, you know, was um, just kind of um, letting me have a go. And then I'd get over it in a bit. You know. Yeah, that kind of insecurity. Yeah. <laughs> but, mm. um, it, after three days, it really click. And one of the big things you do realise very quickly is that you've got a massive team of people around you. And they're all... If you didn't actually speak as a director, it would all happen anyway. Actually. Yeah. Like the work is done. <laughs> but it's, at least, it's, you know, the, the job of director is what you are able and willing to make of it. Yeah. So, you know, some people don't do much and others do more. Okay. So, uh, going back to Halifax, which you're, you're, you know, the area you're from, Halifax is. Um, either where your story is a setting or nearby or mentioned, you know, it, it shows up in every other thing that you do one way or another. That was never, uh, that just happened. I don't know why. Yeah, it, you go back to that inevitably, but you said that you, when, you know, you run for the hills, when you went to London, you wanted to be that kind of writer that goes there and, you know, and succeeds in, succeeds in the, in the big city and never go back and all that. And then, you fell back in love with the place and uh, you're going to be remembered as a writer of Halifax. You know that. Yeah. You're aware I'm of that. I'm aware of that now. <laughs> <laughs> if I was younger, I would have screamed. I think that. Um, no, I'm very proud of Halifax and I'm very proud that um, I've been able to make shows that are set in Halifax. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, it's, um, I think it's wonderful that, you know, we can now make mainstream drama that is set in the provinces. Which is fantastic because we go out to, you know, what things happen actually. <laughs> so uh, talking about um, Halifax, the Bronte sisters lived not that far away from uh, Anne Lister. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually Emily uh, was very, very nearby, so in whole uh, during uh, uh, the time yeah. that she was a teacher. Yeah. So um, we can only dream with the crossover. <laughs> No, you um, think about these kind of things. It, it's it is just a fantasy of uh, you know, like uh, it's, it happen. It's really <laughs> tantalising because there is no reference to Emily Bronte in the journal. In Emily, well, journal. it's fiction, but um, <laughs> there are references to Miss Patchett in Anne Lister's journal, who Emily yeah. worked at Law Hill. And there are a lot of references in the Bronte's novels to Anne Lister when you look at it. <laughs> You know they're they're oblique. They don't literally name her, but if you, if you know what. And you the know. red room, I think something about the red room, like uh, it is. Yeah, it was the red room in Sibidon Hall that is referred somehow. I can put it, you know, up now, but it's some kind of ref, um, note in some of the Bronte's writing. I can't remember that now. Uh, I can't, it just came out. Um, so fiction come on a little bit like uh kind of a meeting just by chance or whatever i'm just joking don't worry <laughs> no, no, I'm, i i'm gonna i'll play around with it when okay great <laughs> we'll get another series of gentleman jack after this one and who knows yeah we're looking forward for that uh i have to say uh okay um just a uh, thing about awards uh, which is something that we didn't cover um you've been uh nominated since you started your uh, you've been consistently and non-stop nominated from 2002 uh, when you became a, a showrunner when you started doing your own shows as a creator uh, the, but as a writer you've only been nominated twice if, if I'm not mistaken and won both of them like for Happy Valley and uh, the other one now I'm losing it uh, uh, which was uh, which was the second one that you won for a writing? No, it was Happy, Happy Valley twice. Twice, that's it. Last angle. That's it. So, uh, do awards uh, help? And do you care? <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I do care because um, <laughs> some people win them. Yeah. And, um, uh, and it does make a difference. It makes a difference. Um, it's surprising when you win the BAFTA how much the phone starts ringing a lot more. Um, and, and it's a, you know, it's a recognition as well that you've done something. So well, it helps. It helps, it helps my self-esteem. <laughs> <laughs> well, it helps sell new shows and it helps gives, yeah. I think, And it helps, um, uh, you know, publicity and marketing, if you can put... Uh, From award-winning... Happy Valley, it'll say five BAFTAs on the front. So. Yeah. And they had to give them more. The comedy ones, all to Happy Valley as well. So, um, <laughs> what? Uh, just a um, quick, um, you know, final questions. Uh, like, what are, we, are you watching TV nowadays? You, yeah. you were saying about Netflix, and what, you know, what titles are your, you know, your intention? Um, with rat, rat, ratchet, ratchet, ratchet. I love that one, and people are not enjoying that one. <laughs> They enjoy it so much. All in about two days, which I just never do that. It, <laughs> I, it really blew me away. I just, I don't quite know why. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing with this kind of show. It was shot. I love the way they filmed it, and I love the performances. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that people just don't behave like normal people, <laughs> and you just don't know what they're going to do next because you just realise you're in a slightly alternate universe. Mm -hmm. I thought it was fantastic. I thought it was a real breath of fresh air. I really loved it. I just want to write a show like that now. <laughs> <laughs> and did you? This is a weird question, but did you? Um, during the uh, the confinement and the pandemic and all that, do you, uh, sounds like a psychiatrist, but uh, did you feel that you were changing like your habits and watching things besides what you said that you were feeling a little bit blocked with the uh, writing or disperse right. or whatever? I had this kind of weird thing during lockdown that I suddenly noticed that I was thinking about the past of all. Hmm. I was listening to music from my teenage years at one point which mm -hmm. that was a bit too much time on your hands. I don't know. And then the other thing me and my eldest son started doing was watching, um, uh, we, we watched the whole of the US office, which I'd never seen before. And I thought it was the one by Greg Daniels. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't know. I can't mm, remember. Yeah. I don't think I noticed any credits. I was just, we watched every episode of the US. Yeah. And then we watched the whole of nurse Jackie again. Which I just love, Nurse Jackie. I love that show. Yeah, it was so good. Favorite show mm -hmm. ever, Nurse Jackie. Mm -hmm. And um, we, so we watched the whole of Nurse Jackie again, which was brilliant. That was a really fantastic thing to do. So this has been a treat, and I cannot tell you what it means to me to have shared this time with you. And I don't want to. I have like two more pages of questions I do. So I could stay here for as long as the lockdown is, uh, you know, lasting, but I don't want to impose myself or, uh, you know, letting you go, sadly for me, uh, luckily for you. <laughs> so thank you so much, Sally, for spending this time with us in Serializados Fest. We are, well, I am surely am, but we are all so willing of uh, having you around in Spain whenever it's possible, yeah. either in Barcelona or in Madrid. Please do that. But it's going that we're going to, you know, we're going to go to have dinner and have so much fun. And uh, we, we can hopefully have uh, conversations like this. And, uh, and uh, I'll try to curb my enthusiasm as well. So <laughs> thank you very much, Sally. It's been, as I was saying, it's been thank you. Y a todos vosotros, eh, recordaros que siguen las conversaciones con otros autores eh, de la talla de Damon Lindlove. Uh, eh, pues tengo aquí la chuleta. Eh, Rodrigo García, Josh Thomas, eh, podéis seguirnos en el perfil de YouTube, va a haber un montón de actividades durante todos estos días, ya sabéis, si tenéis todavía la oportunidad también de ver la selección del festival en Filming. Así es que seguidnos en Seguir Fans Fest este año, tan raro, pero con oportunidades tan fantásticas como la de poder estar este rato hablando con Salimena. Hasta otra. Hasta otra.